Well, welcome back. I want to give one final talk on the life of Abraham. If you've read through the story of Abraham, you've probably come to Genesis 22, which has caused you a lot of problems, some confusion, and it might really have triggered you, upset you, and said, this is why I don't like the Christian God. So let me read this story to you. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. And here's what God says. Take your son Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Whoa. Go and commit child sacrifice. And then it says this. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there and then we will come right back. So the troublesome part, which I'm pretty sure you figured out, is... If God is a loving God, why does he tell Abraham to commit child sacrifice? Whoa, that picture is a very cruel God. That picture is a God who isn't loving at all. A God who is so demanding that he even wants children killed. What kind of God is that? What kind of religion would promote that kind of thing? Well, there's three schools of thought, and I want to give the three schools to you just so that you can maybe think this through in a way that is helpful for you. So there's no doubt this is a troublesome passage. But I think as you see these three schools of thought, it might help you work it through in your mind. So the first school of thought is that God was testing Abraham's love. And basically he is saying, Abraham, do you love me more than anything else in the world? And Abraham would have said, yes, God, I do. And then God says, well, let's prove it. I know what you love so much is your son Isaac. So if you love me more than anything else, then you'd be willing to kill your son to prove you love me more than anything else. So that's one school of thought. And sadly, many people have kind of used this passage to say you should love God more than anything else, which means you should love God more than your children, which means you should be willing to go against your children, reject your children, ignore your children, abandon your children, your wife, you should be willing to go against her, and I just go, oh, I don't think the Bible teaches that. I think the Bible teaches that loving God with all your heart includes loving your children with all your heart, includes loving your spouse with all your heart. Ephesians 5 would point in that direction. Ephesians 6 would point in that direction. So there's just issues with this school of thought that are troublesome. Well, then the next school of thought is, that this was a test of Abraham's faith. And so God is really just wanting to prove that Abraham now trusts him totally. And so it goes like this. That God had said, Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And that means out of Isaac. So Isaac has no descendants yet. He's not married. He has no children. So if you kill Isaac and he doesn't have any descendants, then true faith would say, well, God promised us descendants through Isaac. So 
the only possible solution is God's got to bring Isaac back to life. And so what this school of thought is saying is Abraham went off because he had perfect faith now in God's promise that a descendant would come through Isaac. He went off to sacrifice Isaac without a qualm because he knew that in order for God to keep his promise, God would bring Isaac back to life. And so that's school of thought number two. School of thought number three is that the writer is giving the perspective of the world at that time around God, the common religious beliefs about God in order to show that they're wrong. And so the common belief about God was that God was a demanding God, that God was a God who wasn't willing to be involved in people's lives, to meet their needs, to care for them. And so in order to get God to take an interest in you, in order to get God to do stuff for you, you had to be willing to sacrifice something. And so if you wanted God to do great things and God wasn't accepting the lesser sacrifices you were offering, you had to become come to a point where you were willing to sacrifice what was most precious to you, and then God might go, oh, oh, okay, maybe I'll do something for you if you're willing to sacrifice something for me. So that was the common mindset. And so the school of thought would say that Abraham operating off of that mindset is feeling he needs to sacrifice his son to prove that he loves God more than anything to, in order to pr show that to God so that God will do stuff for him and God stops it all. And God provides a lamb. So just as Abraham's about to sacrifice Isaac, God says from heaven, stop. And he provides a lamb and he says, sacrifice the lamb. But I'm not that kind of God. I'm not that God who says, you've got to do all of these sacrifices to manipulate me because I'm an unfeeling, uncaring, distant, angry God. That's not the God, the true God. And so this school of thought is saying, it's painting a new picture of God for that culture. It is showing what God is really like, that the common beliefs about God are all wrong. That God at his core, at his, his essence, is love. Not demanding, selfish, disinterested, angry. I want to leave that with you. The lesson from this story is God's not like Maybe what you've been told. God isn't a distant, uncaring, angry, selfish God. God is a God at his very essence who loves, who cares, who wants the best, who gives. And I hope that just encourages you. Let's pray.